Awesome. Okay, so why don't we start by having you um, just briefly introduce yourself, um, your name, where you're zooming in from, um, and uh, what you're working on right now that's exciting to you. Sure. Um, so I, I'm Mitch, and I'm currently zooming in from Pattaya, Thailand, uh, where I'm originally from. So I actually, I was born here in Thailand, and then I, I grew up uh, in the Middle East. Um, and then I went to the Bay Area for college and worked in, in, in tech for a while, not as a developer or anything. I was a tech recruiter. Um, and then several years ago, I, I moved back here uh, in 2017, which is around the same time that I uh, got became immersed in this world of, of crypto, you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and uh, Web3. And um, started off, you know, I didn't have a technical background um, either, but um, I was just very curious about the technology and why people were so excited about it. So I started um, a, a blog that turned out pretty technical. Um, so yeah, so I just started writing as a way to learn about the space, about Bitcoin, the, uh, the technology behind it, learn about Ethereum and the types of applications that people are building on top of blockchain technology and you know implications and things like that. Um, and then after a year or two of, of just writing and just kind of being in the space, like on the sidelines, like not exactly like jumping in, into it professionally right away. Um, I, I kind of had this urge to, to like to, to build stuff and not just, you know, like watch it being built and kind of uh, write about it, like as a commentary on the sideline as I wanted to, I wanted to kind of be immersed in like, you know, the, the struggles and the, you know, the, the, the hardships of like trying to build something so ambitious and um, you know, so kind of has the potential to to change the way economies work, the way we interact with each other, the way people can uh, transact and interact and and, and uh, collaborate and things like that. So I started. I learned to to program. Um, this was last year. Yeah, I learned to program on Ethereum. Uh, I joined a uh, a developer bootcamp that was run by Consensus. Um, so it's called Consensus Academy. And um, yeah, so that's where I learned smart contract development, which is how you develop applications on Ethereum in order to build this project that I'm working on now uh, that aims to uh, reduce the friction between um, consumers and gamers and uh, wildlife conservation. So um, that's my kind of my main project, my main gig that I've been <clears throat> working on for, for about a year now, full time, um, as, a, as everything like co-founder, developer, um, you know, partnerships, product manager. Um, and yeah, I mean, besides that, uh, I've been involved in a lot of, of DAOs, um, decentralized autonomous organizations this year, which is where I met Yaler, but we can get into that <laughs> later. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah, I feel like we just zoomed through a lot of really interesting content. So there's a few things I'm going to come back to. Um, but I'd love to go back to the beginning. I think you said around 2017, you got involved with the crypto community. That's what, right. Yeah, what was like that initial um, excitement to start a blog? I know you mentioned like, learning about different types of economies um, and, and changing how that works. But um, to go from, yeah, writing a blog and then learning to develop in that space. What was the kind of motivation behind that? Yeah, um, I think I was lucky um, in my in the way I entered the space in that the people that I learned about the technology from weren't the, you know, people who, who were just pumping and dumping and trying to like, you know, teach people to make a, how to make a quick buck. It was, um, I worked for a, a company called uh, Instacart. They do um, on-demand grocery delivery as a tech recruiter. So I, you know, my day to day job would, be, would just be to interview software engineers and data scientists. So kind of, I was like familiar with tech lingo but I wasn't developing anything. And one day um, Naval Ravikant 
came to do a fireside chat um, in, in our office and he had spoke about Bitcoin and crypto in a way that that got me interested. Like it was that, I remember that day, it was kind of like the trigger for me to be like, okay, I should look into this thing. Whereas before people were talking about trading and I was like, I don't, I don't know what this, I'm not interested in, you know, <laughs> like watching charts all day. Cause I thought that's what it was. Um, so yeah. So Naval talked about, you know, economies and just, um, you know, money at speech. And then that kind of got me uh, into Andreas Antonopoulos's content. Um, and he does really good uh, YouTube videos and, and talks about um, about about uh, blockchain. So I so I actually had to move uh, back to Thailand because of visa reasons. <laughs> so it was actually um, I you know I was completely happy where I was like in in the Bay Area like everything was going great. But then you know like the elections just wrapped up and there's this thing uh, in in the U.S. where um to get to get a work visa you have to enter like this lottery and basically I just didn't I didn't make it in the lottery so that's why I had to come back but um so I started a blog as to kind of like to kind of share initially share with my close friends and, and family about what was going on in my life like hey I'm back in Thailand I like I'm gonna uh, join a company as like this operations office manager at the time and recruiter but um, I'm also interested in learning about crypto. So it was just a way to kind of update people in my, the people in my life of what I was interested in and what, like, what was next for me essentially after moving back to Thailand. And then after like that initial post, I was like, okay, I'm going to do a post about what Bitcoin is. Um, so I just did this long post about like what Bitcoin is. And it, it was called uh, Bitcoin explained using emojis. And this was in uh, August 2017, and it explained like everything from like you know history of money to blockchain to to, to what Bitcoin is, and it was all using like emojis. So um, that was <laughs> so that was that was pretty cool. And uh, Naval actually like retweeted it and shared it, so it got quite a few um, eyeballs. And then that kind of built the momentum for me to to write more and explore more um, about the space. Uh, and and people were interested in hearing more and that's what I that's what resonated with me and that like I realized that I could uh not really teach people but like help them understand uh something like I didn't set off to do like a course or anything but I just wanted to I liked writing like that's what I discovered essentially um and then you know things kind of came full circle with Andreas Antonopoulos because I I ended up contributing to his uh mastering Ethereum book that he open sourced. So like it was like on GitHub and you can make pull requests with, um, you know, your own writing into the chapters and that got merged in. Um, so that was that was pretty cool. And, and so, I mean, like I still write to this day um, as a way to kind of clarify my thinking and um, ensure that I understand things. Um, but yeah, that that's basically the long winded <laughs> thing of how I started writing. That's a major claim to fame. I didn't know that you had a section in uh, Mastering Ethereum. That's pretty awesome. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. My name, yeah, my name's on the list of contributors. I think that was the first time my name's ever been like in a bookstore. Not so that's pretty cool. <laughs> so it sounds like you had a little bit of an audience for this blog. Like it started with your family, and then like people tuned into it. Is that? Yeah, so it kind of reversed because the initial audience was for people who knew me and were like interested in what I had to say. And then they they stopped knowing what I was talking about <laughs> like because I was talking about crypto. So um, so yeah, so and and that was kind of like at the cusp of like when the ICO was gonna was about to boom. So uh, I, I'm very glad that I that I um, ensured that the content that I was writing about, like the content that I was cr creating was more evergreen and educational rather than like, you should buy the, the, these and that, that token. Cause you know, where are those types of articles today, right? Like how, um, but, but um, I feel like the, the stuff that I had published over the past few years, and it wasn't even like a weekly thing. It was like once every month or two. 
um, or maybe more. Um, it was just like whenever I got interested in something, I just wrote. Um, so yeah, I mean, like it's, uh, I mean, people keep trickling in. I think a lot of the discovery is, is just through Google now. I don't do that much to promote it. Um, I'm also curious about what it was like to learn how to program. Um, so if you wouldn't mind elaborating a little bit about that process, like if it took a while, if you were like, ding, light bulb, I know it all. If there were people, I know you mentioned like a program helped you learn, but if there were people in that process as well, um, like that's a, to me, that seems like a really big <laughs> bit to bite off. Um, so I'd love to hear you speak to that process. Yeah, um, so the learning to program thing or just coding in general was something that I, I had a deep like urge to do for a while because with when I was uh, doing tech recruiting, I had to talk to a lot of engineers about the projects that they worked on. And that was always an exciting conversation for me to like just, just realize that you can have an idea and then you can actualize it um, if you have this skill um, of programming. So it was always something that I was like, you know, like something in my brain that I was like, I, I, it would be cool to learn how to do this. Um, and I mean, I took some Udemy stuff like on and off uh, for a while, like doing some iOS and, and um, odd things here and there, but it was never, there was never like a reason for me to do it, or there was never like a project I was building towards. It was always just like, learn how to learn this programming language. And then like, there's some small projects along the way, but it was like, so what? But then this, uh, the opportunity with Ethereum was that I, I, I saw that um, it was still very nascent and the need for more developers in the space was very like, it, like the call for developers was very loud. Um, so I thought that it would be a, just a, like a valuable, skill to have and it would also kind of scratch this this itch of like wanting to build something and um and luckily uh consensus academy had this uh like scholarship program where if you live in you know like a like a less developed uh country you can like kind of apply for a scholarship and 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 i was lucky to to receive that and it was i think it's a i think it's a th three month program yeah like a 12 week program where they take you through everything from, you know, how to write basic stuff to best practices to like security, how to design apps in a secure way that um, prevents uh, hackers from 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 hacking into your app because there's a it's a unique problem with um, uh, open like developing on open blockchains because if there's a bug, someone's gonna find it and someone's gonna attack it. Um, and you know you can't hide anything from people because it's it's all open source, so security concerns is just like kind of taken to the next level. So I thought that was a a nice way to like an important module that I think every new um, Solidity developer needs to learn. And Solidity is the the programming language that you use to develop Ethereum applications. Um, and so I I think. In terms of difficulty in my journey through that, it was definitely challenging, but uh, the support, I, it was designed very well and that like the support was very good because consensus, especially uh, at the time consensus had a lot of resources to pull in and they're involved in building a lot of the core infrastructures of Ethereum that that is widely used today. So um, the materials were up to date. Um, and the most valuable thing I got out of that was the final, the final project, like you have to build your own final project at the end, like a full decentralized application. And just what I learned from that basically took me from, from, from basically zero to, to like right now I, I'm freelancing um, in addition to my, in addition to my full-time job, I'm, I'm freelancing as a, as a, more, a smart contract uh, developer. So it took me, that program, like it took me from zero to being like a paid, smart contract developer, like Ethereum developer. So it was just a super rewarding thing. And I'm very grateful to Consensus Academy for, for that. And um, yeah, and so I, I went back to, to be a mentor for, 
for the program for for two cohorts now. So um, yeah, I was I was there three cohorts ago, and then I, I I've been a mentor for the for the rest of the the time. Oh, that's so cool that you've gone back now to help other folks. Um, yeah, that process. I love a good full circle. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeller, did you want to jump in? I'm having a hard time hearing you. Nitch, can you hear Yeller? No, I no, I can't hear him either. Looks like you're a little bit frozen More. up, Yeller. Oh. Keep going. <laughs> We can hear you now if you want to jump in real quick. I was just going to say, I feel like that's that's quite prevalent, I've noticed, in people paying it forward. Mm, yeah. Um, so, so you go through this program, um, and now you have all these skills. You're entering into the world of Ethereum. You're like smart contract extraordinaire. How was the process of... Um, finding a space for yourself in this community? Um, like, had you already been kind of mingling with folks in, in the community? How did you kind of get your in to the projects that you wanted to work on, to the DAOs that you wanted to be a part of? What was that like? Um, so I, hmm, this feels like a lifetime ago, even though it was like two years ago. <laughs> um, I actually, uh, so from the from the years like when I came back to Thailand to last year, so like two years um, uh, before I entered the the crypto space full time, I was actually working at a an innovation center uh, that was owned by a university in Bangkok that holds a lot of hackathons and developer events and um, you know educational events. Um, so as a sort of project manager um, for, for that innovation center, I, 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 I played a role in uh, organizing a lot of the local uh, Ethereum events that were happening. So it started off from like local companies to, you know, international projects coming in and like trying to uh, teach local developers about Ethereum development. Um, I worked a lot with uh, companies that are based in Thailand, like um, Umiseiko to, to put on these events and I'd like Plasma. Uh, like Ethereum Foundation actually came a few times because Vitalik uh, was working with uh, OMG on Plasma. So it was cool to have to host uh, Vitalik and some folks from uh, what's now Optimism. Uh, they work on Plasma uh, to do some uh, events here. So I think, that was my first experience um, in, in the Ethereum world, just doing local events. And then I helped uh, UNICEF Innovation put on their hackathon here as well. So um, that's where I met uh, Simona, uh, who was doing Bounties Network at the time, and they were one of the sponsors. And someone, you know, MakerDAO flew in and like Gnosis and Status, and we had these kind of sponsors and we kind of mingled when, you know, uh, as hackathon organizers. But, um, but I, it, it still kind of felt like it was a, even at that time, it felt like it was a one-off thing where it was like, okay, we do this event and we work together and it's great. And then like, we kind of go separate ways. I wasn't as immersed in it um, like online until, un until this year actually. Um, and I, I only joined DAOs uh, this year and um and you know and i don't live in the us so it's harder to kind of go to to these international events um and there's not a lot in thailand um so yeah how i found my in i i think it was very gradual it was through like it was through uh going to events and, and meeting people but it was also just get, becoming involved in in conversations around topics that interested me about the space. There's like, I mean, crypto is kind of uh, its own world in itself, but then within the space, there's like pockets of 
um, different interests that people kind of gravitate to naturally. Um, I, I feel like people find uh, come into the ecosystem for for different reasons. I mean, they they come in uh, for they kind of share the same values, but the types of values are like weighted differently. If you know what I mean. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, some like money is for sure one thing, but then there's this like idea of like um, open finance and like bigger ideas of like you know uh, democratization and like open access and you know not letting physical barriers and and where you grew up be prevent you from from becoming the best person you can be. Um, so I, I I gravitated heavily towards. Um, the NFT community because I I feel like NFT so uh, NFTs are, are non fungible tokens which are like digital collectibles so if you think about like uh, online avatars um, you know RuneScape The Sims um, Second Life uh, you know things like that and I played a lot of RuneScape so this I understood like the vision of this this metaverse like right away uh, but yeah so it's basically like you 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 have this space online where you can like interact with people around the world but crypto allows you to actually collaborate and exchange value with them as opposed to just like joining forums and just like joining a chat room right um so you can you can tra uh, you can transact value and collaborate in more meaningful ways because because blockchain is a layer that 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 kind of ensures that this stranger from across the globe is not gonna like cheat you out of something um, the way that they can do in like a in, in like a RuneScape type world. I don't know how, how many people know RuneScape, <laughs> the RuneScape reference, but that's what I keep coming back to. Um, so yeah, so I, I think I found definitely my, my space in, in this metaverse uh, community of NFTs and um, some decentralized finance, but but mainly like, how do we, what are our virtual experiences that we can share no matter uh, where we are in the world? And just to clarify, NFTs were non-fundable tokens, is that? Um, Non-fungible non tokens. So, um, so you have like, uh, let's say you have Ethereum, mm -hmm. which is fungible. So like one Ethereum is worth one Ethereum, but with NFTs, uh, one, um, like one digital cat is not worth like one digital dog. Like you can't exchange them for the same value. Yeah. I appreciate your explanations and your metaphors. Great, great analogy, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we need a Uniswap for NFTs, right? Like one dog, one cat. Yeah. 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 <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Um, and you mentioned, oh yeah, go ahead. I also just want to say, I love seeing the threads connect because Simona is actually the first person we ever interviewed for this show. So knowing that you- Oh yeah. Locally <laughs> and that like, you know, she's a mentor for all the programs as well through consensus and now she's doing other things with status. But I love seeing- that. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. But she's like, she's everywhere though. <laughs> she's a powerhouse. She's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah like my idol. Like, <laughs> yeah she's awesome um yeah so you mentioned in the past year you've gotten involved in some DAOs. do you want to just quickly touch on which ones you've been a part of which ones you're feeling really excited about um be cool just to to hear you speak to some of the DAOs a little bit yeah so um the DAO that i'm primarily involved in right now is metagamma delta which is um which is a DAO that started off in ETH Denver earlier this year um, as like a meme sorority. Uh, basically, some uh, some some people kind of realized that a lot of the DAOs and a lot of like the uh, pockets of communities in Ethereum were very like male male dominated. So we were like, so they were like, oh, uh, let's spin up a DAO that's like, you know, with a mission to support uh, women in the space. Um, so, so the mission was to to just like you know spin up a sorority and um, and you know like welcome welcome like the women like the the women who are working in the space 
uh, starting projects in the space because there are there are a lot um, of, of wonderful women in the space but to kind of like shine uh, a light on what they're doing and you know just have a supportive community for them um, and a, a, a build a supportive ecosystem around them to to um, move their projects forward and um, so my role in that is mainly uh, like I mean right now I, I'm in more of like an operational role so I I do I was in charge of um, migrating the DAO from well this is more like of a technical thing but we we migrated from like version one of this DAO it's like a DAO framework to to version two so it involved basically moving everyone from one technology to like an upgraded version of uh, of the framework. So I was in charge of that. And then like also uh, there's there's operational things in DAOs like, you know, approving um, new members and like making proposals about what to do with our funds. Um, so I've been in, in, in charge of that and also like doing some, you know, just attending meetings and, and you know, talking to people and um, meeting new people and answering any questions they may have because we we open we we open the um the the DAO or like we welcome people even if they're not uh working in crypto but are curious to learn about crypto so um it's a nice ways to just you know have a have a friendly space um for people to to do that because twitter can be a a hostile <laughs> place Crypto Twitter is not exactly the most friendly environment yeah. for onboarding. Yeah. I found Metagamma Delta. The halls of Metagamma Delta are an amazing place to hang out. I'm super proud yeah. to be a member of Metagamma Delta. <laughs> no, I don't fit the norm. We actually have we actually have halls. We actually have halls uh, in the in crypto voxels. I built a, like a sorority house. I don't know if you knew that. But um, <laughs> I've never seen that. I'd love to see it. And for Kate, crypto voxels is what is crypto, what would you call crypto voxels? Uh, niche. Uh, it's basically a, a virtual world where you can, um, you know, walk around as avatars and uh, explore different parcels of land. And um, you know, the land, the land is like up for sale. The land themselves are tokens, non fungible tokens. Um, so um, you can buy a, a token and then you can you can buy a piece of land and then you can build your own whatever on there. And what's cool about platforms like crypto voxels is that you can display your the NFTs that you own on there. And, and people use NFTs now. NFTs can be like anything from like uh, digital art to uh, music to you know virtual parcels of land. Um, and so you see these like art galleries in, in crypto voxels and where you can like see see the art that people collect and own and it's almost like being you know in a in a virtual museum and um the thing is that these physical pieces th these artworks are tokens on the blockchain as well so they can be traded you know they can be sold and you know one of the things that I really, really love about what's happening in the space right now is the is the opportunity that it has created for artists um, all around the world who don't necessarily who before this don't necessarily have like the access to um, you know display and and sell their work um, on on online, um, let alone you know not have like extravagant, not, not have their, their prices being cut by extravagant um, fees. And so there's these platforms now where you can like upload your, your digital artwork and then like sell it and then actually like receive your money right away. Um, and then these, these pieces of art can be displayed and shown in places like crypto voxels. Um, so it's, it's still very like niche and, you know, um, like if you go to this, to this website, it's almost like it's like a early 2000s sort of <laughs> technology, especially for my old laptop. But 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 it's there and like and and you can kind of you can all you can almost like taste what's gonna happen to this thing in like five years, ten years when it when it does get there. Um, and when it does, 
where you're like, oh, yeah. this is cool. And then it's like that thing might dissolve and something really like interesting might come together. But yeah, when you have a good 20 minutes and your laptop is feeling nice and cool, Kate, we can take a walk yeah. <laughs> to the Rayfield Castle to the halls of Metagamma Delta. Yeah. <laughs> I would really love that. Because when you said like, I've taken a walk through the halls, I'm like, oh, that's like, oh, you know, just a saying, but no, there's <laughs> halls to be walked through. <laughs> yeah. That's super cool. Um, were you like, were you always someone who enjoyed the idea of kind of like alter universes? Like, did you play a lot of like those types of games as a kid? Like I'm sensing some interest and passion around this, like create an avatar in a whole other world and explore it. I'm yeah, just curious. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I, I, I did play a lot of those games. Uh, I played a lot of like, simulation games like uh the sims and then like um uh mmo rpgs multiplayer online games like um runescape like i said and then also like club penguin um if anyone remembers that um so yeah i i like the idea that you can go somewhere um and just be whoever you want um and then just kind of like express yourself in ways that you don't necessarily get a chance to um on a on a day-to-day -day basis i mean some people can kind of get lost in in that world but um with this one with, with uh what's happening with like the web3 empowered metaverse i think people can strike a nice balance between like their skills in the real world and how they can leverage that using this technology. It brings me back to something you were talking about earlier, um, the real need and demand for developers in the Ethereum space. Do you have any thoughts about the dominance of developers versus the need for other personality types or skill sets in the Ethereum space? Oh, yeah. I mean, I feel like we need we need more. I, I feel like we need more. Um, Uh, communicators and people who can people who can um, articulate the values of of the ecosystem and what we're trying to do. Um, one person I think does this really well is is Andy from Andy from Status. Um, so Andy. he, uh, yeah, yes, yes. So. Um, I I joined the kernel program, uh, like the, the Genesis block, which is kind of like a incubator community type um, program for people who are in Web3 to meet each other and learn from each other and like hear from project leaders in the space. And they have they have like weekly fireside chats with people like Yuan Benet from Biocoin and like uh, Vitalik came um, one time, but but Andy was in charge of the readings and kind of like not yeah I, yeah syllabus and kind of the weekly readings that you do as a part of the kernel program and this is um, public so it's just kernel community I think is the website where you can read it but it it presents the ethos of what Web3 is trying to do in a way that I think is not, it should, it should reach more people, especially people who are looking at the space uh, for the first time. Um, and I feel like I, I was lucky in that I, I, I found people like Andreas, but if I had this resource um, when I was learning, and kind of trying to wrap my head around like why are people excited are excited about this uh this would have been a really great one so uh yeah people who can articulate the vision um communicators people who are people who are building it just not for just like technology's sake but uh they recognize that we're building this for the betterment of of humans and of the environment and to you know fix the systems that are broken or that are that have been like artificially pumped up to not be sustainable for 
you know, society, the environment, you know, um, and, and, and things like that. So, so I think, yeah, just like people who are excited about how we can alleviate those pains and how we can build towards that future rather than let's build like this complex technology because we can. <laughs> I, I think that's sometimes where actually a lot of people get lost, right? The messaging around what's possible and what's trying to be done with Ethereum is lost. It, you know, you lose the forest for the trees, but right. those individuals who have like really strong like uh, values around what they want to do are the people who that really shines through, right? Like, and, and this should lead into like you telling us about your wildlife conservation project. Um, but I totally agree with that. And little known fact, I spent a week with Andy Tudhope in like a 14th century villa in Spain. What? And, like the most amazing like conversations and I had never met him before. So I know exactly what you're talking about when you're like, yeah. like Andy's this just like cosmic download of love and joy yeah vision and you're like you're a philosopher king like what are you like what yeah like, with those, like rice sack pants that he wears so, yeah. like, <laughs> such a great guy that actually reminds me i was gonna tell you kate um you, you should definitely apply for kernel you might love it it's definitely yeah right now genesis block two is coming and it's i've only heard amazing things and i'm gonna be there too so yeah, uh, I think I'll be there too as a as an alumni, just like to answer questions and things like that. Awesome. <clears throat> so yeah, let's pivot to uh, wildlife NFTs. Tell us about your passion for the earth. Yeah, so um, so this project it's called Last of Ours, um, and it started off in the idea kind of like brewed in uh, late late 2017, early 2018, when we, when CryptoKitties was uh, booming. And CryptoKitties is kind of like the first time that people realized the power of digital collectibles and NFTs. So CryptoKitties is, are like digital caps that you can trade and breed um, on Ethereum. And um, one time it sold for like hundred, like over a hundred thousand dollars. And I think it's going up again now. So anyway, so um, we took a look at that and we saw that people were able and willing to spend money on digital cats um, that didn't have a representation in the real world. And we were like, you know, if only like a portion of this money could be channeled towards protecting the real world counterparts of, of these animals. So we took this idea to the first ever, I think, NFT hackathon in Hong Kong in the summer of 2018. Um, it was called Nifty Hacks. And so we kind of, uh, Decentraland, which is actually another uh, virtual world platform, Decentraland um, played a big hand in organizing that hackathon. So I actually built our, <laughs> it's like the first version of like what an animal sanctuary would look like uh, in the virtual, in this virtual world. So I was just like on Decentraland and I like imported these like 3D animal characters and they were like, you know, eating and, and, and things like that. But um, each of them are NFTs, but each of them also represent a real life animal. So, so, uh, so what, so, so the idea of the, the, the platform is that you buy an NFT and half of that goes towards an actual NGO that is working um, towards protecting the, uh, this animal, that species in the wild. And whenever you trade, um, a portion of that also goes to them. And this is something that, you know, eliminates all the, the need for like having to go through a middleman and like having that initial donation being just shizzled away uh, by uh, administration fees at each step of the way. Um, what, what blockchain allows you to do is to channel the, the money from the user to, to the NGO's wallet directly. Um, in a transparent way. So you as a collector, a buyer, uh, a gamer can see that happening like with your own money. And then what you choose to do with your animal, you can, you know, collect them and like play them in games or you can, yeah, learn about the animals. But um, 
but the but the the goal with this is for the experience to be more you know gameplay and entertainment versus like educational um because i think there's a lot of there's a lot more um consumer demand and like revenue to be to to be had in, in gaming that can be channeled towards the, the real world conservation but they can always like learn about the the conservation efforts if they if they choose to have a peek behind the curtains so how does one go about acquiring one of these little critters <laughs> uh, you uh you can uh wait for me to finish developing the smart contracts <laughs> so um yeah so i spent i spent the past year you know learning how to built this thing and um and right now we're uh, i mean i'm pretty much done we're um we're putting the the audit on hold for now but we're we're over the past this past year we've been talking to character designers and game designers um and that's a, that's another thing about this this project is that it brings together stakeholders that have never really worked together before um and then you know, explaining to them uh, what blockchain is that empowers this whole thing, um, and it's it's especially tricky to uh, explain to game designers, um, especially if they are used to the old model of you know uh, revenue generation from from games, um, because NFTs are on an open platform where people can trade and things like that you it's like an it's like an open economy right rather than a closed economy like if you buy something on on minecraft like you can only play it on minecraft and there's no way to to like trade minecraft items for like a, a runescape item but but for this like you can trade an animal like you can you can buy and sell an animal like with whoever because it's just treated as a token on the blockchain um and you as the issuing company, don't, like you don't have control around that. So I think just working through these sorts of paradigm, uh, contrast and paradigm with traditional game designers has been um, a bit of a challenge, but they've been, they've been pretty good. And so, yeah, I mean, the tokens are gonna be the first thing that is gonna be released, but in parallel, the game is gonna be developed. And um, we wanna take care that uh, it's not like a one-time token sale thing, because it's very easy to release tokens and pump them up, but then like what happens afterwards, right? Um, with NFTs, because there's new projects happening all the time, and you know people are gonna FOMO into things if you market them well enough. But like what happens to the kind of the the engagement beyond the initial few weeks? So th this is why we didn't hurry and in, into like selling the tokens right away or even releasing much. Like we have a website, but we don't we haven't like announced anything or released anything because we want to get this um we want to like map out what engagement looks like and what the experience is uh the experience is like after they acquire the the animals i'll tell you what i'm stoked to get a pangolin so let me know yeah <laughs> yeah I'm super excited to spend some of her crypto on one of these as well yeah yeah, how many like how many animals are represented in this? So, yeah, so that's a good question. There are there are fifty five thousand endangered species according to the IUCN, and so a part of the technical challenge is like how do we build a factory to, you know, build these design these animals uh, these different species and still have like a coherent experience, and also remember that within each species, each individual animal is different. Um, so in a, from a character design, game design, artistic perspective, we're still trying to work uh, to see what that looks like because um, they can manifest itself, they can manifest themselves in like crypto voxels and, and different games, but they can also manifest themselves as standalone tokens. So if you hold like, I don't know, a rhino, a giraffe, for example, and then you bring them into crypto voxels, they can they can manifest themselves as that. But then you can also look at them at your in your wallet in your website, and it would be like just like a picture or a, like a card. So um, yeah, there's a lot of design challenges that we're that we're working through. 
Um, but that's the thing is like, the I feel like the challenge of this year has not been a technique, like a, like a Ethereum blockchain technical, like that's not been a challenge. Um, I don't think we're inventing anything new really with uh, the smart con at the smart contract level. Um, what we are trying to design for and what's, what's hard to design for is uh, how, how does the user experience still be coherent with this economy and how do we um, still design for engagement and retention given that given that the users are free to um, to play their animals in a world that other people have built. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And I'm just really interested because to, to me, I think this game is so much more important and worthwhile than something like crypto kitties. <laughs> it's like, all right, what's a better game? You know, a game of collectible cats where we clog the Ethereum blockchain, or like I would happy happily clog the Ethereum blockchain for <laughs> species, right? Yeah, I mean, I I love I love the fact that um, I mean, Crypto Kitties, uh, uh, Daffer Labs, yeah, the the company that made Crypto Kitties, they're they're kind of like the the pioneers or the individuals behind them are like the pioneers behind this and this technology that that like the standard um, behind this NFT token in the first place. So it's, you know, the, I, I'm very thank, grateful for them um, for what they've contributed to, to the ecosystem. And that's what I love about the space in general too, is like the, the things that you invent for yourself can also be used to further the space as a whole. Um, so that's like composability. Of, of technologies, right? I mean, even the even the communities on Ethereum are composable, <laughs> right? Like it's like building blocks, community building on each other and kind of um, uh, helping each other in, in various ways. Yeah, that's absolutely been my experience watching people go so much farther together, um, building on top of what has come before. And even if a project doesn't succeed, you can take those things and recycle them forward instead of having it yeah. like the IP and dying forever. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Um, so we have about five or six minutes left. And I'm curious to know, first of all, when, you know, ballpark we can expect this project to launch. And also like, as you've been creating it, if more ideas have been brewing in your mind, um, and if you might share a little bit about what you're excited to create in the future. Yeah, um, so ETA, I think we have the, the, the ballpark target is, is March, April for token release. And then we have the game experience being um, developed uh, in parallel, but that's not gonna be done for like a little under a year. Um, so we're still working out like contracts with, with game designers and, and studios right now, but, um, but new ideas. Yeah. So I've always wanted to, so, so with this gaming thing, um, I, I kind of, I kind of hesitate to like incentivize people to just be on their phones or to just be on like in, in virtual worlds. Um, I played a lot of, I, I enjoyed playing Pokemon Go just because it got me outside. Um, it helped promote real world businesses, you know, like to put popular Pokemons there or whatever. Um, so in terms of user uh, player experience, I want to emulate the Pokemon Go experience, um, not necessarily like clone that, but um, encourage people to do actual things in the real world. And that is the gamified thing, right? So. Um, I've been exploring uh, this thing called, this technology called composable tokens. So you have, so you have NFTs, but then composable tokens are NFTs that can own other tokens. So um, you can own like other NFTs, other uh, cryptocurrencies. So I've been playing around with the idea of like, okay, what if you have this companion rhino and, or let's say, okay, let's say you have like a, a companion turtle and you go and you clean up a beach in the real world 
you can actually earn an NFT for your tur turtle. So let's say like you earn like a shield for your turtle and that itself is an NFT, but the turtle owns it. So now like your game character is now a turtle with this shield, which is if you plug it into the gaming world, people will now know that the only way that this turtle could have uh, earned this shield is that this person has gone and cleaned up a beach in the real world and like helped protect turtles. So um, that, I mean, the first the first thing that does is maybe like increases the value of, of, of the turtle if you, you decide to trade it because of the rarity of this shield. But then it also gives um, the character itself like another dimension of value besides money. It's kind of like a proof of care, proof of, uh, you know, work in the real world or whatever to support the cause of the project as a whole. So that's um that's something that I would really like to to have happen. Um but it's still, you know, <laughs> in my head. You're gamifying positive contribution. Yeah. Oh, Neil, you broke up again a little bit. What we heard was you're gamifying contribution. <laughs> Followed by, I'm assuming, a very <laughs> excited reaction. But um, <laughs> yeah, what I, I mean, you're I'm getting a smile just hearing you talk about this because it's um, not only is it uh, a brilliant idea; it's one I've like I couldn't have imagined in my own brain, I guess. Um, and I, you being so immersed in this, like gaming meets economies meets um yeah bettering the world is that's just there's a really interesting intersection there um so i'm like i'm gonna be following you and seeing what else awesome. comes out of your mind because it's really it's really innovative and um yeah i guess my my last question is something we like to ask everyone um for those who are just entering the crypto space and um, having their acclimation period, uh, what what kind of advice would you give to folks who are finding their way in, in this space? Um, my, my advice would be to first uh, not jump into put money in things you don't understand, um, especially if you know, you're seeing you know, numbers going up and, and people are excited and like thousands and thousands X returns like that's, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't really advocate for that as your first experience, because it's not, uh, I mean, one, like you might not even get a taste of what the returns are like, and two, it's not sustainable, even if you do. So um, I would say just like take your time and like identify the people who are uh, who, whose values seems to uh, re resonate with you. And, um, and there's plenty of those people if you know where to look for them. Um, so you can join, you can join communities like Metagamma Delta um, or Meta Cartel or, you know, people who are willing to, um, you know, answer questions and, and share uh, resources that helps you um, find your way. And there's a lot of projects even that, um, or, or, or products to help bring people on board people into the space. So I think when you're looking for products, just look for those types of, um, of products. And then when you're deciding who to trust, <laughs> when, uh, you know, as your mentor, as, as your guide throughout the space, like just, I don't know, just, just, just be wary of, of what their values are. Um, and yeah, lots of reading, lots of research, lots of playing around with applications. Um, I think there's no better way than to, to just to just try out different applications once you're comfortable with what's going on behind them. Awesome. Yeah, Niche, thank you. Oh, the other, you want to jump in? No, I was just like, yes, like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, we are so grateful for you to spend the hour with us chatting about what 
you're passionate about and working on it is i'm all hyped over here so <laughs> thank you for inspiring me and um i'm sure others who are tuning in will also feel that secondhand inspiration and we'll be ready to buy some <laughs> animals when they come out <laughs> and spirit creatures spirit creatures yeah we're calling them <laughs> calling them what spirit creatures spirit creatures perfect um yeah thank you thank you and um yeah we look forward to to seeing what comes comes out of this project definitely thank you Nitch. keep talking. you posted will do likewise thanks for having me this has been really fun <laughs> This has been awesome. <gasps>